Welcome to Well Warrior Culture, a community of support based on my books, Wellness Warrior Style, Mindfulness for Warriors, The Mindfulness for Warriors Handbook, and the 21-Day Meditation Jumpstart Journal. This is The Well Warrior Show, and I'm your host, Kim Colgrove. I work with society's warriors, protectors, guardians, and healers, and your families to help you rebuild resilience and embrace well-being. If your profession exposes you to trauma and the trauma of others, Well Warrior Culture is for you. You deserve to live, work, and retire healthfully, and I'm glad you're here. And now, on with the show. Hello, and welcome to the Well Warrior Show. I'm your host, Kim Colgrove. Today, I'm sitting down with Jess Flores, and Jess has a podcast called Next Shift, and I'm really excited to talk to her about this podcast and everything she's doing. She coaches law enforcement professionals who are exiting the career for one reason or the other and helps people thrive and succeed in whatever is the next chapter. And I know from the people that I've talked to over the years, this can be a huge issue. What we're talking about today can absolutely apply to retirees, but we're really going to focus a little bit more probably on mid-career folks who find themselves needing to leave the profession for one reason or another. So I want Jess to introduce herself, tell us what about her background and what she's got going on. So Jess, welcome to the Well Warrior Show. Tell us about yourself. Kim, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute honor for what you do and for what you've been through and what you're now helping the warriors of society out there to do. I appreciate it. I'm honored and humbled uh, for sure, because this is something I never saw myself doing ever. Um, but I am Jess Flores. I am a KCMO area native. Uh, I won't give out where I grew up or where I am now, but I'm in the area. Huge Chiefs fan. I'm married. I'm a cat mom. I spent 10 years in law enforcement um, that almost felt like 20 years uh, based on the first department that I worked at, um, which was a huge city here. Um, I came from a real small town, so it was a big wake up call to how different life was. And I chose to start at 21 years old, which we're also kind of figuring out who the heck we are and what we want to do <laughs> at that age anyways. But I was in college right after high school because it's what you were supposed to do. Um, I was the good girl always. I did what I was supposed to do. I did what other people expected me to do. I was a people pleaser. Um, so I went to college. I had no desire to go to college. I didn't care about anything I was doing there. Um, but the show CSI when I was growing up had become huge. And I thought, oh, my God, I want to be an investigator and I want to solve this crime. And I want to be this voice for these victims that don't have one. This is it. So I went to school to be a biology major. What? Um, because on CSI, they were in the lab all the time. Clearly, we didn't have great counselors at my high school to like guide you <laughs> on where you actually needed to go. Um, but very quickly in my first semester, which was almost would have been my second semester because I went in with so many credits, uh, I quickly learned, yeah, no, I don't think biology is it. Um let me go do a ride along and see the other side of what this looks like. And I had no desire to be a street cop. I always wanted to be a detective, but I did that ride along at 18 years old in the inner city. And I was hooked. I was like, really? 18? Oh, wow. This is it. So, wow. So at 18, I kind of decided this is what I'm going to do, but you have to be 21 years old to be a police officer. So I was like, well, what the heck do I do in the meantime? So I did as many ride-alongs as possible. I did the Citizen Police Academy, where I was probably 40 years younger, at least, than every single person in the class. Um, I studied my butt off. I changed my major to criminal justice. Please don't do that. <laughs> it's not going <laughs> to serve you later, more than likely. Just just don't learn something to have a backup plan outside of this because you never know. Okay. What would you do if you, could you go back and you had to redo or do over? What would you do? Would yeah. You just, study? just don't do that. I would have, <laughs> I would have dug into the psychology part. Maybe honestly, I think it's fascinating, but I just didn't care. Then I was young. I was dumb. This is my path. This is where I'm going. You weren't going to stop me from it. And then somebody stopped me from it about 10 years into it. Um, I worked in my first apartment I loved working the road. I loved the chaos. I loved the routineness of the job, which sounds weird because there was a certain structure and routine to it. 
but no night was the same. No night was um, sitting in an office, you know, five days in a row behind a desk. It was, I can leave when I want. I can do what I want. I can stop who I want. I can sit around and do nothing if I want. Um, I loved that aspect of the job. The adrenaline dumps, or at least the adrenaline pumps were huge. It was so much fun. And then it came down and I was like, oh, and then I was on midnights. So we all know what lack of sleep does. Uh, that's horrible for your body. Um, after four years, I had been shot at. I saw a, a response from my department that I didn't really expect. I expected it from the public, but not my department. And at that point, I really had to reevaluate. I think I was 25, 25 at the time. And I was like, mm, if my own department's not going to have my back when I get into the worst scenario possible without getting actually shot, um, I'm I'm not good with that. I'm actually going to just roll out <laughs> and be good and see how else I can change the world. So I left and I decided maybe I want to be a nurse, but I'm not sure that's a lot of money to spend going to school when I hate school. So let me become a CNA and just see what I think. I got licensed. I hated it. I hated watching normal people die in a hospital bed and their families be devastated and actually having to connect with them because I was their caretaker. Like it was horrific. I was like, I am not meant for this. No, let me go be a cop again. So, and it still felt like a calling. I still felt called to serve my community in that aspect that I had been armored to take on the battles that came from being a cop. Um, and I still, I hadn't made detective. So I didn't really hit that goal that I had for myself when I got in. So I went to a smaller agency, I worked through patrol very quickly, got detective very quickly, and then from there made sergeant very quickly because I saw the need for some leadership that I hadn't seen. Um, but unfortunately, I had developed a nagging hand slash wrist injury to my gun hand. And I finally decided when I got promoted and was put back on midnights, I think I did it for about a year before I was like, I can't keep ripping off this brace on the way to calls, hoping nobody sees it. Um, I can't even hardly grip things that I should be able to grip. Um, I can't barely write. So I had surgery. They told me I would be good as new in three months. Well, six months went by and I still wasn't better through two different types of physical therapy and occupational therapy. And I finally just had to make the decision that my career, I guess, was going to be over. A second doctor told me if she went in and did surgery, she'd probably nick a nerve and I would have no feeling in my hand. So it was either have a second surgery and no feeling and use your hand or deal with the uncomfortableness and the pain and not being able to grip or use it like you should be able to. So <laughs> either way was not a good scenario to stay in law enforcement. And just 10 years in when I thought I would get 25 plus was when it was ripped from me. I thank God for it now. <laughs> Things have taken a turn for the worse out there. But at the time, it was heartbreaking. It was miserable. I was angry. I blamed a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have blamed. But I see it now, eight years later, uh, that it was a blessing in disguise. Yeah. I So I want to let folks know that there is an episode on your podcast where you really go into this story and you, you mm -hmm. tell the full, full story. It's really, really interesting. And, uh, it, it, I mean, really it's, I felt very empathetic towards you. You know, you kind of pulled me into the story and I thought I can really, uh, understand how that would feel. You have an idea, you have a plan in your mind. I mean, nothing upsets us more as humans when the plan doesn't, you know, go the way we, we yeah. thought it would go. And, but, you know, I know you're not alone. And now that you coach others and I, I kind of want to segue here just for a, a moment and let people know that, uh, Jess was a, a police officer and, and helps law enforcement professionals. But a lot of what we're going to talk about applies to all first responders and anybody who's in one of these, you know, difficult, challenging careers and you love it and you have to leave for one reason or another, whatever that is, mental and emotional problems, a, a physical injury, you know, wh whatever it would be. Um, so so if anyone who's, you know, firefighter or EMS or some of these surrounding professions, I don't want anyone to bail out because the advice you're going to give <laughs> and the, the coaching that you offer people, I know could apply to others, but the world of law enforcement is the world that, you know, so, um, so t talk a little bit about that transition. Um, and I've listened to the, to the podcast episode, so I kind of know that story. So you left, you're upset you, you feel a little bit lost. And then you tried several things after that. Like you are a very tenacious person. You're like, I'm going to figure something out. I'm yes. going to, and you, and you go all in when you, you know, so talk just a little bit about that, because I think this is common that people think, well, I'll do this. 
well, before I wanted to be a, a, a first responder, I thought I would do this. I'll go try that. Uh, but nothing, you know, nothing kind of clicks. You want to talk about that just a little? Yeah, for sure. Um, again, went into law enforcement with a goal of this is the rest of my life. So I did not have a backup plan. When I tell you, like, if you're going to do the college thing, have something that is outside of this. I, I seriously, seriously mean that if college isn't your thing, find something that is and have something that you can lean back on. I wish every first responder out there would have a side hustle of some kind, something they are passionate about, something that makes them feel purpose, something that they can make money with, obviously time is money. Um, but something that you're passionate about, if you don't have that, you are just so, so lost. And you said it best. Like I thought I did everything possible to not wrap my identity in being a cop at that second department. My first one, lost in the sauce. I hung out with cops in my off time. I was dating a cop and lived with them. Um, I talked police all the time. I loved it. I, I would help out anywhere I could. Second department, I was like, time out. Let's reset. I saw what happened last time. I want this to be a long career. I'm not going to do that to myself. Well, unfortunately, when it was ripped away and I didn't get to have any control over that, I mean, yes, I put in my weeks, but I could not go back. There was zero chance. It was like somebody stabbed me through the heart. And I was like, well, wait a second, who am I? I don't even know who I am without this title, without that badge on my chest, without that sense of pride and honor and service. And again, who's going to speak for these victims? Like all of the things that I had prepped myself for in this career, I was like, what the heck? And my now husband, he was was uh, we were dating at the time he was an officer so there was a little I would never say I felt jealous of him but looking back I could be like that was rough because he was still getting to go to work every night he was still getting to do this job um, and in some respects I'm glad that I got to stay somewhat close to it um, but not so close to it and again it is going to be different for everybody depending on why you're leaving. If it's something like this, you might feel those anger emotions. You might feel hurt. You might feel like you need to get as far away from law enforcement as possible to kind of heal and really figure out who you are. Some people who are choosing to leave and I just want the next thing, maybe you don't have those emotions and you can go into something very similar to law enforcement or supporting law enforcement. Um, it's going to be different for everybody, but I would highly suggest that when you do have those feelings, you evaluate them and where they're coming from and dig a little deeper on them. Self-reflection and self-awareness is huge. It's key to getting you through this trans uh, transition. Um, I personally, I knew, holy crap, I had been on long-term disability getting 60% of my pay for eight months. Like I needed something to pay the hundred percent of my bills that I still had. Yeah. Um, and I thought all the things, let me be like an insurance adjuster. Let me be anything that seemed translatable from law enforcement to outside. That might have some no investigative component to it or something. things you were yeah. interested in. Yeah. I had no desire to do any of those jobs. And every day when I was on Indeed or I did not use LinkedIn then, but when I was on Indeed or whatever some of those other ones are back then, um, none of the jobs jumped out at me. Nothing seemed appealing. Nothing seemed as adventurous as law enforcement, nothing seemed as purpose-driven as law enforcement. I was just like getting defeated, but I was applying. I was spraying and praying. Also do not suggest that <laughs> have a goal in mind and like a direction, but I was spraying and praying. What can I apply to? How quickly can I apply to it? And then of course the rejections are coming in. So I'm sitting there as a, was I 30? I think it was 30, a uh, 30 year old and being like, okay, well, I got a lot of life left to live. I have to work everybody's rejecting me. What did doing all of that in my law enforcement career the past 10 years, I was 31, I guess, 10 years have to, like, what is that? What do I have to show for that? I'm getting nothing. I'm getting nowhere. Nobody cares that I was a cop for 10 years, that I did X, Y, and Z in my career. And that was damaging to my ego. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. There's, can, I want to pause you right here because yeah. yeah. I'm, there's, there's so many nuggets here. Yeah. So I think the one, the first one that jumped out at me is, uh, and I'm very familiar with this, because of people I've talked to over the years yeah. is people who over identify with the profession are the last to know yeah. frequently often they're the last to know that they were over identifying with. So you talk about self-reflection and self-awareness. So there's sort of a suggestion, I guess, for folks would just be no kind of no matter what's going on in your career, maybe just check in because you use the term purpose-driven and that's it for a lot of people who get into these professions. It, they have to do a job 
th that they feel is purposeful and they're making a difference. And so, and, and that that's true of law enforcement for sure. Um, but then without knowing it, they start to live like, I'm a cop. Yeah. That's who I am. And that over identification can really harm people in their personal life, in their relationships, and certainly if they have to separate from the job. And yeah. it bothers a lot of people at retirement, but it mm -hmm. smacks them upside the head like a two by four. So if I if I dropped into your life at your mm -hmm. second agency and you had a little more conscious awareness of this, but if I dropped into your life and just said to you, hey, do you think that you are over identifying with the profession? What would your answer have been? I would have laughed at you and been like, absolutely not. Um, but reflecting back, yes. I mean, I didn't do a whole lot outside of that. I slept. I hung out and watched the Royals because they were really good at that time. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not to beat up on anyone. I'm trying to be clear. I'm not trying to beat up on anybody no. or, you know, so anyone who's listening that. Um, and, and be proud of your profession. Of course, yes. it's, it's a noble profession, yes. but the reason I'm bringing this up and kind of shining a spotlight on it is just to get people thinking about, do I have balance in my life? Do I have balance, uh, or is a high percentage of my focus on work? Yes. Let me just take a look at that. And then the other thing is you don't want to live your whole life with a backup plan every day, waiting for something to go wrong but it probably is a good idea for all of us, no matter what's going on, to always kind of have a, a, some kind of a backup plan yeah. in the back of your mind so that maybe some people can avoid this really long, hard road that you, you sure. ended up having to traverse. Okay, and yeah. And having so a network outside of law enforcement, looking back, would have been absolutely huge because every person you know is a connection, is an opportunity. You have to be willing to talk to people though, which is something we don't often do in law enforcement because everybody sucks, is what we think. When <laughs> <we're in it. laughs> yes, because yes, all yes. we're seeing is the bad. But if we're not having, you know, those church relationships or those gym relationships or those family relationships and those friendships outside of law enforcement, then our circle really is just this. And when we get out, it's even harder to be like, okay, well, because these people here in this little law enforcement circle aren't the ones that can help you get that job outside of law enforcement when you get out. So super, super important to network outside of your law enforcement circle. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> I've heard this. I mean, I've read this in books. People write books about this, you know, people yes. who are retired and I've, I've heard this so many lessons times. learned the hard way. It must be true. <laughs> I keep hearing the same thing. Yes. Okay. So while you're continuing to tell your story, just throw out any, like you are any of these lessons or suggestions or ideas, because you've walked this path and I really feel like the work you do can help save other people months and maybe even years of struggling and suffering, you know, yeah. by just taking some of your hot tips. And that is my goal. It took me a lot of years, one, to get unangry um, and to really accept that my career was over. And like I said, I was taking jobs to make sure my bills were paid. There was zero purpose behind the jobs. There was no mission. I didn't see how I fit into the mission. I was waking up every day custom like, oh my God, this cannot be it. But my bills are being paid. Um, and that is just not a way to live. So it took, I did that for about two years before my health started suffering a little bit, nothing major by any means, but the weight gain had come on. The depression was definitely there. I was functioning, <laughs> but I was definitely depressed. Um, when you look back at some of the things I was going through, my dad's health went down the drain and he was suffering things that my grandpa actually was killed by with his diabetes and his heart disease. Like he started having those issues. And I was like, I cannot, I will not sit around and become that. I will not sit around and become that statistic of an ex-cop who is now dealing with these severe issues. Um, so I started a health journey through a direct sales company um, and it changed my freaking life. It was something, one, that I could focus on, um, something that I could control. I can control what I eat. I can control how I move. And I had used this wrist and it doesn't operate optimally ever, but I had used that as an excuse to stop working out. Well, I can't work. Well, that's odd because you can run your legs work. You can walk. You can do different things. You can find ways to adapt what you had done before to what you can do now. It was this whole mindset shift. And as much as it was a health journey focused on fitness, their mindset part of it 
shocked the hell out of me. I didn't expect it. And it really did. It changed the game. Part of the requirements, what requirements in quotes, was to um, do personal development for at least 10 minutes a day or read at least 10 minutes or 10 pages. I like, I like it. Personal development, who cares? Like, I don't need that. No, every single person needs it. You need to see what you are capable of. And then I was in this big ass group of about a thousand women, similar goals, all different bodies doing the same workouts, um, some further ahead, some behind, some at the same level as me. And it was just this accountability of let me show up for, if I'm not going to show up for me, and community, and community. I'm community, community is it, huge. Yeah. Accountability and community are two game changers in this transition for me. You have, you're leaving a community, so you better find a new one to be a part of as quickly as possible. And do you find that kind of, I, I apologize for interrupting. No, I'm just, good. I'm so into this. Okay. So do you find that the, the normal go-to is to isolate? A hundred percent. You feel yeah. like nobody gets it. Nobody understands you. And what I have learned every single day since is that you are not alone. God didn't say, I think you're going to be the only person in the world that's going to deal with this. He said, nope, you're going to go through this so you can then help the others who are doing this um, when it's your time to help them go through it. And if this isn't religious, sorry, I'm, I'm a believer. So that's who I lean on. Okay, well, we'll <laughs> just do a please. caveat here. Everyone who's listening, take it or leave it. Take what resonates, yes. leave the rest. You know, not everybody has the same path and we're just, yeah, yeah take what resonates. The universe, your spiritual, whatever, go with it. Um but yes, I believe that accountability and community were game changers, having something to look forward to, something to work toward, a goal, a challenge for yourself. Um, and then, you know, you're watching all these other people do it who are in far different circumstances of life than you. I was watching brand new moms. I was watching moms with like five kids and I had no kids. I had I was not pregnant, nothing. I had no excuse to not do what these ladies were making time for. For. So it literally just kept propelling me to keep doing the work and to see the results that the others were seeing. I was like, okay, 90 days later, I didn't even recognize myself. I bawled my eyes out because my body looked different. My mind was so incredibly different. Thankfully, I had this newfound sense of, I can do whatever I want. It was the first time since like my career that I felt indestructible. I felt that rookie like invisibility that we all have, like nothing can bring me down now. And I just bawled. I bawled and I bawled and I bawled because I was like, there she is. There's Jessica. And that I'm was two, back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was two years after getting out. So <laughs> it took a while. My goal is to help you not take that long to find that spark again and then move on. But then I did. I kept working jobs that were like, okay, like there's no purpose behind this. I'm just doing what is my thing. I want to say I had like six jobs. And some people will tell me, even when I work or think about coaching with them, they're like, I don't want to hop around. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Good for you. None of us want to do that. Yeah. But when you had a goal for your whole life figured out, and then you're trying new things and you're like, yeah, that's not it. Life is too short. It can change in an instant as I'm well aware. Um, and it's too short to be miserable. Like it is you, you are in control of that. So if you're not happy doing something and you've given it a fair shot, you know, give it a shot. Maybe you're just uncomfortable. And once you lean into it, you'll get more comfortable. Um, but I didn't, I took all those different jobs and each and every one taught me something, but all of it eventually leaned to me being miserable at a job, making friends with a client, this adorable 75 year old woman, uh, was a client. We started going to lunches together. She knew I didn't love my job and she would always try to give me ideas or options. Like, what could you do? And she told me about a friend of hers that was a CEO transition coach. And I kind of like, <laughs> I did that dog to the head side thing and was like, what, <laughs> what is that? Mm -hmm. And she explained like this lady helps people who are CEOs transition into life after being a CEO and what that looks like at home. Um, when you're not in the boardroom, when you're not in charge of, you know, millions of dollars and things like that. And I was like, oh my God, I can help ex cops. I, I stopped her in her tracks. I was like, I am so sorry for being rude. I'm going to grab my phone and take some notes because I'll forget. <laughs> um, I took down some notes and we kind of flushed some things out like, well, what I only want to help ex-female cops. No, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> I want to help those who lost their career in law enforcement, whether it was firing because of the craziness that's happened since 2020, whether it's an injury that took their career, uh, whether I didn't at the time think mental health as being something. Um, thankfully that's become more prevalent, but yes, anyone who lost their career, I wanted to help walk them through it because it's not an easy road. And eight years ago, 
there were zero resources. I remember Googling the hell out of things and being like, somebody please help me. Like, what do I do as an ex-cop? Like, where's a book? There's none. Where's this? None. And now there are so many books. There are so many people. There is such a community out here that it, it's heartwarming, but I'm honored to be a part of it. That's for I sure. I love what's happening. I, I love what's <laughs> happening in the first responder world and that we're able to talk about mental and emotional health now, that people are are, are willing to be honest and say, um, I left a career I loved and I was miserable. Uh, people are are open now to say, oh, I realized I had over identified with the profession and I didn't even know who I was. Like all these conversations used to never happen. You yeah. know, the number of people I've seen on my podcast tell me that they got out for their mental health or for their family. I just got goosebumps because that is not when I got in 18 years ago, that was not an option. Nobody talked about it. When I got out eight years ago, one, you didn't leave the profession. Nobody was just choosing to leave the profession. And now people are, and I love to see it. I I know we need good people out there, but you have got to take care of yourself. If you get to the end of your career and you're just miserable, horrible things can happen. And there, so, that's not yeah, how that, life is meant that, to live. That's the, I mean, and that's kind of the end goal with these conversations for me. And we talk about this with in, in Pause First Academy. We have um, a training for retirees and people that are going to retire in five years. And then we talk to people who are starting out their career and, and mid-career and encouraging people. I, I, I think I've maybe I've said this to you before. Um, I, I say this in almost every class I teach and almost every conversation I have. When you leave this job, no matter why you leave or when, when you leave this job, the job goes on the next day as if you the never existed, as if you never exist. I mean, it has to, it has to be a well-oiled right. machine. But if you leave your life early because of health problems or heaven forbid, you take your own life, the re, you know, that, I mean, that happens. If you leave your life early, your friends and family do not go on the next day as if you never existed. And so as hard as it is to face some of these things, these conversations like we're having today, I want people to pause. I'm hoping. And like you said, the self-reflection, the self-awareness, how am I doing? You know, um, my father-in-law passed away in April and he was in law enforcement, you know, his entire adult career. And uh, a long time ago though, you know, he was a police sergeant in the St. Louis area. And I felt so sad for him at the end of his life because he had a lot of unresolved trauma. Because like you said, back then there was no such thing. You put in your 20 years, your 25 years, your 30, whatever. And you didn't complain. And you didn't say, I need a minute, you know, I need a mental health break. There was none of that. So what happened? Uh, people became horrible alcoholics. They ruined marriages, maybe multiple marriages. They, um, they had a lot of broken relationships, people in their lives, you know, all kinds of things. And that doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. So I'm really grateful for you that you're putting yourself out here. You're talking to people. You're very honest and open about your story very. because I think that that takes vulnerability because a lot of people don't want to say I had an injury and it literally broke my heart to leave this profession, this dream profession. And I was miserable for two years. You know, a lot of people yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't admit to all that, but yeah. so thank you for sharing your story and for being honest. And yeah, I, I, I want everyone to like open up, listen with both ears. Because this, yeah. this is some really good stuff. And wherever you are in your career, pause. Because you might be healthy and doing great. You never know what's going to happen. Have this information in your toolkit or in your back pocket so that if anything does happen, you're armed, you know. And All that's right. what I tell people every day is prepare today for what could happen tomorrow because we don't know. We know more than anybody in this life that tomorrow can not happen for it for any number of reasons, or it could look very different tomorrow for any number of reasons. I can tell you, I did not expect a wrist injury to take me out of this career. And I will also say that the vulnerability and authenticity piece, thank God for those, that fitness journey and another journey I took, um, because that I didn't know how to be myself for so many years. And being a cop, you were told who to be, how to act, how to talk. You did not get to choose how to dress how to look, you did not get to choose anything. You couldn't even be vocal about certain views about things. You were restricted in that. And I did that for 10 years. I did it. I was a good soldier. Again, the good girl. I was doing what people expected of me. And then when it was, it was a reality that I was not going back to that, I finally was able to peel back a lot of layers and be okay being figuring out, first of all, who the hell Jessica was, and then leaning into who Jessica is, what mission I have in this life, whether my purpose was 
a little bit different on the streets, I'm still getting to serve people. I'm still getting to serve a community. I'm still getting to be a voice for victims, people in departments who can't use their voice yet or won't use their voice yet. They're struggling and they're, they're not able to say that. I get to be that sounding board for them. I get to be that voice and be like, I don't give a shit. I'll talk about it. And I will come on and I will talk about it with people because I don't have any fear of repercussions. Um, and finding my voice has been the biggest gift of losing my career. One thousand percent. Amazing. <laughs> and you and I both know people who transitioned out of a career and it was very, very difficult and they weren't ready to transition for whatever it was the reason, but they found a new mission. They found a new purpose. They, and you know, I, I, I think a lot of people feel bad about themselves or they get hung up on this purpose thing. I don't know what my purpose is. And, you know, there are jobs and careers and professions out there that off the top of your head, you wouldn't name it as a purpose-driven right. career, you know, like something as big as, you know, law enforcement professional, yeah. but you, you don't know what might light you up and where you might really be of great service if you don't take this step back in this self, yeah. this self-awareness and, and, and kind of discover like who you really are, what are your gifts you know yeah. you have to you have to x i know you you did this and you know this you have to excavate like what are my gifts what are, what else do i have to offer the world and i know a lot of people who came through that and they're doing great work and they're happy i mean some of them are like i was a cop and now i'm a yoga instructor i mean it, yeah. it, it can be that varied you know that different it, and maybe it's crazy. maybe they're helping other first responders in their mm -hmm. yoga profession or their yoga business maybe they're not yeah. but um if you went back five years ago and talked to them and you said, this is your future, they would have said, get out of here. Yeah. And I think it's crazy. It took, I mean, so I got out in 16. It took until I want to say 22 before I was really able to have this full circle moment of, okay, all, all I went through in my career, all I went through after and all the things I don't enjoy being, I came up with next shift. So it was like five or six years out that I finally kind of came full circle and was literally able to tie. I was doing an Instagram live and I started bawling talking about it, but I was like, I get to be a voice for officers who don't feel like they have one. Right. I was like, Oh my God, that's literally why I got into this. I but love I, had it. To, I had to be open-minded enough to see it that way. I had to be willing to put myself through all of those different things and learn and unlearn different parts that I had learned from being a cop and see what was out there. And it's funny when I talk to people who are still in and people who are out, so much more open-mindedness on this side. And it is. My mind, that was another gift. Like, I learned how to be open-minded and be able to hear different perspectives and views that were different than mine and be like, okay, cool. I'm glad you have that. It's not mine. Let's move on. Uh, that was not something I had in law enforcement. But when I talk to these people, they cannot see that it'll be a hard transition. No, I got it. It'll be fine. Like, they literally can't see any of it. I'm like, have it as a seed in the back of your mind that maybe when it happens, it's not going to be easy for some people. Yes. It seems very easy. Um, what I've seen people who go from law enforcement to a law enforcement support role, maybe with some of these bigger companies that we utilized in our career, we're now going to them. So we're still talking to law enforcement every day. We're still in these departments talking to officers about how to utilize the equipment or the software. Those people seem to have a decent first transition at least, but they're still dealing with law enforcement every day. It will be interesting to see what happens when they don't have that piece or that connection anymore. And still you need to be prepared for what that will look like. That's a community you're used to being a part of, you're in a different part of it now. What's gonna happen when you don't have that? And how can you be you and utilize everything to create your next shift? Yeah, okay, let's talk about next shift a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Can you kind of walk us through when someone, if someone reaches out to you and they're curious or interested um, or they sign up to use your coaching services, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, and I'll back up because there are a few different pieces of next shift. My main goal, focus, and mission for you is to really uh, rediscover your identity. Who are you behind that badge? Uh, to help you rediscover your purpose, because it could be similar to what you did in law enforcement. It could be completely different. It was just a part of your purpose, your career was. Um, and then reignite the passions that most of us set aside and don't have time for, or we tell ourselves we don't have time for in our career. Yoga instructors, perfect example. They love those things. They set it aside. And now they're like, oh gosh, that would have been really helpful if I had leaned into that in my career. Let me help others lean into that. But that is my biggest goal to help you peel back those cop layers and figure out who you at your core 
are. And then again, if a next career is what you need, because most of us are pretty young when we get out, we figure out a direction for you to go. Um, and it might be one that surprises you once we do some of the exercises. Um, but we do that either through coaching and I do one-on-one -on -one coaching currently toying around the idea of group coaching after some th different things that I've done, but I have a single session. I personally do not agree with that. I don't think you're going to get enough out of a single session, um, but that's what some people want. And if you're willing to raise your hand and say, Hey, I need some help. And then this we is talk. Not, yeah, I agree with yeah. you on that. This is not a one and done thing. Yeah. This people is not kept asking. A, a conversation with a, and, and maybe that's a good way for people to dip their toe in the pool yeah. to see if it's for them. Mm -hmm. But you know, if, if you're serious about this, uh, yep. to, in my opinion, and just based on some things that I've done in my own life for my own personal growth, there's yep. a, there's kind of a, a continuum of growth when you're working with some, a mentor or a coach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's the single pack. Everybody had asked for it. I did it. It has not been like going off like people, like I expected it to based on the requests, but then I also have a package that is three months, six calls. I used to say bi-weekly, but it's your calls. It's your six calls to utilize how you want over those three months. Um, unlimited messaging in between, because I know things happen in between every two weeks. Um, and I'm there to support you in whatever that looks like. Most of the people I work with are looking for a next career. So I am assisting with job hunting because I have a lot of time <laughs> during my days and evenings um, where I can be on those job boards and I can be like, oh, hey, or my network is ever growing especially on LinkedIn and people are constantly posting and I can say, oh, hey, um, I have stopped sharing my network with people I'm not working with because I don't know you. If you want to work with me and I can know you and I can get to know the person you are and what you're really looking for and that you would be a good fit for something I see, then I'm willing to share and connect the two of you. I'm not willing to do that. Otherwise I learned. Fair that enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Learn that lesson. Seems odd that somebody would expect that, but <laughs> it's, it's odd there. I have yeah. noticed a lot of people want the work done for them. They are not to a point oh, yet where they do it. Um, and that could be a whole nother conversation. Yeah. But... Well, we, we were in a take a pill society. Like I want to yeah. lose weight. I want to take a pill. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't and here's the deal. I'm here to support work. you. However I can, my goal on each call, how can I support you this week or, you know, these next two weeks, blah, blah, blah. I can help find you jobs. You have to apply for it though. You have to actually reach out to the hiring managers and make connections. You have to build your own network. Um, because I have, I've had people reach out and be like, Hey, I see your network's gotten really big. Blah, blah. Okay, cool. Go grow yours. <laughs> like they're there so, for the taking. <laughs> so before they get to the step where they're looking for an, uh, they're you know trying to build their network, looking for the network. Do you start with, um, help like some kind of aptitude kind of test and help them kind of get inside themselves yes. so that they can, because I think, um, people that I've talked to, including my own adult children from time mm -hmm. to time and their path in their life. Mm -hmm. Um, if you ask some people, well, what lights you up? What are your passions? What are your natural skills? I and don't strengths? know. And a lot of people will say, yeah, I don't know. This is yeah. just all I've ever done. Or I really don't know. Yeah. So, so how do you help people get over that hump? Yeah. So we do actually have a few exercises. And since I've talked about them on my podcast, I don't mind sharing them here. It's not like it's a special. Well, I don't want you to give away the secret sauce or the, anything. I'm just, you know, just no. <laughs> <laughs> it was on my podcast. So one of the main things I do is we you get out a notebook piece of paper and you title four different headlines of um, identity, purpose, passion, and skills across the top. And you set a timer because you'll go nuts if you don't give yourself a timer of 10, 15 minutes. And you list out as many things as you can under each of those categories. What is every single thing you identify as? And it is more than just a cop. I assure you, you're a wife, son, husband, daughter, mother, father, like whatever it is, a Christian, a whatever, like it is what it is. You put everything you identify as in that category. What gives you a sense of purpose? If it is my job or being a cop or being a voice for victims or serving my community or whatever gives you a sense of purpose, being a father, being a mother, you put it there. Your passions. This one might take some time because most of us are like, I don't know. Okay, well, do you enjoy fishing? Do you enjoy getting outdoors? Do you enjoy moving your body? Do you enjoy woodworking? Do you enjoy making craft beer, whatever it is. Do you ever ask people, sorry to interrupt, but uh, no, sometimes right. when I'm talking to people, I mean, I'm not a coach, but just casually and, and someone gets stuck and they're like, I just don't even know what, I don't know what makes, brings me joy. I don't know what I like. Sometimes I'll say, well, let's flash back to when you're like eight or 10 or 12. What'd you like to play? What yeah. were you into? Yeah. What were your favorite subjects? Like, I'll just, you know, say like, let's start there. Sometimes that can help people excavate 
very yeah. much so your childhood, like the inner child in you, what did that person enjoy doing um, can be very, very helpful to get that part of the list. And then your skills and people get stuck here all the time. And I'm like, oh my God, we had so many skills to be a cop. It's, it's crazy to me, but um, to help them, I created a 25 transferable skills list that you can get on um, my LinkedIn or my Instagram. Just go to the link in my bio. And it's at least a starter. Here's 25 skills for sure that you have. Here's where you utilize them. So your brain can really process. Oh yeah. Okay. And we can be confident saying that I have this skill set and then how to translate it out. But really then use that and look at that sheet and be like, okay, wow, I am a whole lot more than just a cop. And maybe just maybe there is something that you could draw a line across. Maybe it's a little rigid, but you can draw a line across all of those boxes. And that's now a path that we can explore. What careers could we look at that have all of these things that you want or that at least go across all of these things and would fulfill you? Um, then we can start digging into a path. Spraying and praying is not the answer. You've got to have a path, whether you know a job title or not, companies are using all kinds of funky names now for different things that yeah. are the same thing. Um, we got to have a path. We've got I, to. Yeah, I love everything clarity. you're saying. Yeah, I, I, and I want to say too, for anyone who's like, oh, okay, I'm kind of curious about this. We'll give all of Jess's identifiers and all, how you can contact yeah. <laughs> her and how you can get her stuff. We'll make sure we'll you know, hang with us all the way to the end and then it'll be in the show notes. So all her contact information will be available. No worries. Um, so that is coaching. That is what coaching looks like with me. Um, it is not me doing your resume. It is not me, um, focused solely on getting you a job. Like, yeah, that's part of your next shift for sure, but we need to figure out who you are first. Um, for those who aren't quite ready for that, I know it's hard to raise your hand as a cop. I know that <laughs> and ask for help in any way. Um, so starting last year, I created a DIY course to help you prepare for this transition. Um, it's based on my own story and the lessons I've learned that many that we've talked about here, um, but also utilizing the six pillars of wellness and how when one of those is out of whack, life can feel very out of whack. So if you focus on having all six of these in place before you start preparing for, and as you go through this transition, it will be a much smoother road for you. Um, so there's some topics that are listed for each one. There's a video from me on each one of those. And then there are journal prompts to really help you get that self-awareness and self-reflection piece um, and be like, Oh, okay. Well, I thought I was good in this area and maybe I'm not so good in this area. And then again, if you want to reach out to me afterwards, you're like, I really didn't realize I was this, uh, gone. <laughs> so that's the individual things? course. Individual course. People can purchase from you and yep. go through at their own pace, their own pace privately. Nobody yep. would even know they're doing it. Nobody that's, knows they're that, doing it. <laughs> that seems like an excellent first step to me. Yes. Kind of in the privacy of your own life and your own home, you know, you can kind of work through that course and then you're there yep. if they need to reach out and. Yep. And if you need to deep other. dive into one of those areas, you need to deep dive and you're like, oh, wow, I'm not as prepared as I thought I might be. Um, then the option for coaching is there for you. Um, a free option I give, and it has been more successful than I could have ever imagined is a monthly debrief call. It's a free call. It's on Zoom um, where current and former law enforcement come together I have a topic prepared, but we often don't even get to that point because, well, cops like to talk. So uh, <laughs> we get on the call and everyone, we go around and do introductions first. Everyone shares a little bit about who they are, where they're from, what they, like how they served or where they served, and then what brought them to debrief in the first place. And it usually sparks about 500 different conversations, which is great. I never thought cops would talk in front of each other and they do. And I am just, it is like one well, my you, heart. you <laughs> must have it. created a safe space then. You must have yes. created a safe environment. Yeah. That is one thing I have. That's another lesson I've learned over time when I was with a direct sales company was, man, I saw a lot of people struggling to do X, Y, or Z. And I was like, what if I created a safe container, a small space, just a, just a handful of us and 20, just 20 of us. And people feel safe to let their guard down. People feel safe to have conversations they would have never had. They feel safe to raise their hand and say, I don't know how to do that. Can you help me? holy shit. Yes. And it had, it was the most purpose-filled thing I had done since leaving my career. And I was like, okay. So then debrief came around and each month it has grown in size. Each month I've got a good portion of OGs. I like to call them the people who have been there at every one. And then newbies that are like, Hey, I heard about this. Just kind of want to see what it's about. 
I tell people, come whenever you want. It's set for this two hour block. Come when you want, leave when you want, share what you want. Please be on video. You don't have to, but please, you'll see. And so far, every single person has been on video and it's been fantastic. Every single person has shared. Not one person has been like, oh, really? God, okay, yes. that surprises me. And, and and it was like, oh my God, seriously? Wow. Um, And then people who might've been scared to share were like, it has been so helpful on this call to hear you, you, and you say you went through this because I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only person going through this. And again, I talked about it earlier. You were not hand selected to be the only person in the world who went through literally anything. And that's another exercise I do with people is whether it's throughout your career or throughout your life, depending on what route you want to go after your career, what is every single thing you have overcome? What is everything you've been through and overcome? What can you now have passion about helping other people come through that same thing. Cause we've all overcome a lot of things. Yeah. Hey, your, uh, your survival rate to, <laughs> to date is a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have survived a hundred percent of your worst days. So pick one of those things that you thought, man, I am never going to make it through this. And you did. And now how can you lend that hand backwards to help other people come through it? And there's a freaking purpose for you figure it out. Maybe it evolves over time, but you start using that to figure out where can I do this? The world of digital selling is freaking huge. It's not stopping. It's literally the way the world is going. So if you can create things to help people, there's some purpose for you. There's some passion. That side hustle I talked about, everyone should have. Start it. Start it yesterday. I love that. I hear my friend, Wendy, who's a retired detective, and now she's a health and wellness manager uh, yeah. for a sheriff's department. But I hear her talk about that side hustle how yeah. you know how to find and develop a side hustle when you're when you're a first responder so that debrief call yeah is that uh would that be a good first step for someone that's like oh I, let me just see i'll go to one debrief call and let me just see yeah. uh because again when you're in these professions a huge part of of what people whether it's military fire service law enforcement is that team or community or mm -hmm. family, you know, everyone uses a different term, but these are your people. Like this is your, yeah. this is your crew. This is your, this is your yeah. community. And so a separation from that profession leaves people feeling um, alone, you know, very alone. Yeah. So even this call, like I'm envisioning this call of like-minded people and mm -hmm. however many people are on this call, like, okay, it's a community. Now this is yeah. a community. And so I, I'm sure there's some unspoken, maybe they're spoken, some unspoken roles, like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And we yes. have, and yeah, there's some privacy. I don't privacy. record it. Um, I told people I would not record it. If on a call, I'm like, hey, can I take a picture? Most of the time they say yes. So I can take a picture of the screen. I won't tag people. If people are like, oh, that's someone's a if you're that desperate to see who's on the call, like you got problems, but yeah. um, most of the time they don't care. I take it so that I can show like, look at what's happening. Look, if somebody you're missing out on was, this. <laughs> yeah. If somebody was in the situation, I mean, if they were yeah. working undercover or something like a serious yeah, 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 situation yeah. and they that yeah. would flip off your camera for a second, turn it off. Yeah. So, you know, turn it back on. Yeah. yeah. And I would blank out their name if I needed to or whatever. Yes. Um, it's very private. It's very confidential. I don't allow spouses in there. I don't allow anybody that is not a current or former law enforcement. Um, I don't post the link publicly. Yeah. It is on my email list. If you are on my email list for the debrief event, you will get the Zoom link the night before each call. Um you so ask it, people not to share it with others unless and then I ask people, yeah. People yeah. obviously are like, hey, I know so and so. Okay, sure, get them on my on the email list so that they get the link themselves. Um, and again, obviously, if somebody did see somehow get on there, we would immediately know <laughs> and they would be exited yeah. out of the group. But it is a very private thing, it is a very safe container. It has been one of my favorite things I've done besides the podcast, which I also never thought I would do. <laughs> Man, that's fantastic. Uh okay. Before we start our wrap up and mm -hmm. um, and and close out, um, I want to make sure that people get all your contact information, yep. know how to get a hold of you. I want to just highlight briefly before we say goodbye that you know, guys, if you are you have an impending separation from your profession, or it's already happened, and you're feeling this isolation or this loneliness, or you're feeling lost, uh, I I hope what you're taking away here is oh. Maybe there is some place I can go, someone I can talk to, or a little group I can check out the people who understand me, who have been through the same thing, because this is really the best way to start your healing process. 
have a conversation with someone who's been there, done that, which you so have. Yeah. Maybe join your, your debrief call. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the very least, sign up for the newsletter for, uh, get, yeah. get one or two, like start there. Just like read a loop yep. newsletter <laughs> too. You, know, you can always bail out of any of this. You can always quit and walk yeah. away and quit it. But it maybe just start to open your mind a little bit to, you know, might this, I maybe you never imagined yourself being a part of a group call or yeah. getting coaching. But yeah. if you're missing that family, that team, mm-hmm you know, maybe this is kind of your way back in, get, get with this team or this family and together you guys can figure out what is your next shift. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a grieving process to lose your career. Um, and that is what took me two years to figure out when I finally accepted, I was grieving my career. I literally accepted it and was like, Oh, okay. And was able to move on. It took understanding. I was grieving it to be like, okay, well, I guess it's gone. (laughs) Man, I can't imagine the the feeling of liberation when you get unstuck from that. Yes, 1000%. It was so hard, but so worth it. And clearly it served a purpose for it to be that hard. Absolutely. Man, thanks for (laughs) devoting your next shift to helping others. So how can people get a hold of you? And again, this will be included. I'll I'll put it in writing for everybody. It'll be in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, The easiest ways are social media, both Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is just my name, Jessica, I think is my full name on there, Reed Flores. Um, And then on Instagram, it's underscore next shift underscore. Uh, Basically, they have the same content. It's just from one or the other. Uh, The link in the bio on each one takes you to the exact same thing where you can get signed up for debrief. You can sign up for coaching. You can sign up for the course. Um, And anything else I come out with will be in there. There are some free resources also at that link. Uh, The 25 skill sheet, uh, daily habit tracker so that you can get yourself in some sort of routine. Also very important. Um, but yeah, that's where you can get me. Okay. I'm going to do a closing slide so that people can see it, take a screenshot or whatever. We'll make sure we get all to get your handles, right. So people yep. can, can find you. And, um, yeah, I encourage you guys, if this is something you're struggling with, reach out to Jess and see if she can help you along the way. Don't be a long sufferer here because there's so much more good out there and there's so much more you can do. So take a deep breath, stand up straight, pull your shoulders back and take those steps, take those baby steps forward. And one thing I didn't mention, Kim, was the podcast itself. If somebody's wanting to be a fly on the wall, that's a great place to go and listen to other people who have made the transition and what they've done with their lives, whether they started a new career, whether they are now an entrepreneur, an author, a speaker, which a lot of them are, a yoga instructor. It is crazy how many of them there are. Um, But yeah, you have some, you have some great topics and some great guests on your podcast. Yeah. Thank you. But that's a place to be a fly on the wall. If you just want to hear like, what? What's out there? What options? Where have people gone? That's a great place to go be a fly on the wall. I think that's how most people step into any of these, uh, (laughs) any of these interventions, you know, is like, let me just listen in for a minute first. Yeah. All right. Well, man, it's been great to talk to you today, Jess. Thanks for the good and important work that you're doing. I know that you're going to help a lot of people and um, take good care. Thank you, Kim. Right back at you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.